He started his firm with $100 and the advice of a mentor. 14 years later, that Midtown Detroit IT firm is one of the fastest growing Hispanic owned companies in the country. And he has been recruited to two White House advisory panels by the President of the United States. David H. Segura, the founder and CEO of Vision IT, is this week's leader on leadership. He started his firm with $100 and the advice of a mentor. 14 years later, that Midtown Detroit IT firm is one of the fastest growing Hispanic owned companies in the country. And he has been recruited to two White House advisory panels by the President of the United States. David H. Segura, the founder and CEO of Vision IT, is this week's leader on leadership. Knowing when to ask for help is critical when you're in a leadership position. It's getting the best out of people. That's the essence of leadership. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. Welcome to Leaders on Leadership, here with a student audience on campus at the Wayne State University and Detroit Public Television Midtown Detroit studio. I'm Larry Fogues. David Segura tells a story about his sophomore high school computer class and being so engrossed in his work, he didn't notice that everyone else had left. <laughs> Thanks for being here, David. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. In, in those days, in, in the starting out days, what yeah. was the attraction about computer technology? Was it the science or was it the things you could do with the technology? Uh, I, th I definitely think it was, uh, you, know, it, I, I, you know, you think about that time period because this uh, was, was a time where you know, computers were just, people were starting to really look at how they can apply to education, how it can apply, of course, to business. So it was in the very early days, and I'm thankful my, my, my parents got me a, a computer at, uh, you know, age, age 13, 14. And so being able to manipulate and, 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 and uh, you know, manage information and, and being able to create your own games and so forth, I mean, I was just, uh, you know, just taking so much into uh, all the things that you can, you can do. And so it never felt like work. It never felt like it was homework or uh, any type of work. That's why I ended up staying uh, uh, after school and looked around. Every, and everyone had already left. And here it was, you know, uh, they were already starting to mop, mop the floors up, saying, hey, son, I think it's time you, you need to go home. So, uh, so you know, and, and you know what? It continues this day. I mean, yeah. just a passion for technology. Okay. Now, your reputation today mm -hmm. is known, you're known primarily as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Is that how you started your career after you finished your degree at U of M Dearborn? Well, no, you know, so I, I definitely was uh, focused on, you know, pursuing technology and uh, had a real clear game plan, uh, mapped it all out, EDS, one of the great, you know, global IT companies of that time, and uh, had gone through a long interview process and uh, everything was positioned. I just had it signed the paperwork and just before, uh, about a week before I had my finals and I said, can I put it off another week? Well, putting it off that one week changed, was a another directional change because EDS at that point uh, ended up put having a hiring freeze. And so uh, uh, thankfully uh, through, uh, so it wasn't EDS that I ended up going to and it could have taken me out of state pretty quickly uh, within that organization. I ended up finding a great opportunity at Ford Motor Company. Now, in, in the beginning when you were working at Ford, you found time to volunteer to help teach mm -hmm. computer skills to children here in the inner city. Right. That's not a standard pastime for a lot of young professionals. Why, focus, why do that instead of focus on your career or your personal life? Well, I already felt you know, so quickly uh, all this amazing opportunities, you know, going into a, a you know, huge organization like Ford Motor Company, uh, and I knew the doors were open. I was, I was getting access to more senior leaders because of technology, because they, they saw the need, and here I was from a young person to that point uh, really applying technology 
uh, and, and showing how it can benefit the business. Uh, so, you know, having that initial experience saying, wow, look at all the doors that are being opened to me. I want to give back and I want to help other people and I want to especially help a uh, community that I'm so passionate about, which is Detroit, and help especially inner city youth, uh, you know, gain access to those same types of opportunities. Now, careers unfold in, in unexpected ways, and, mm. and in this volunteer process, you met a lady named Lydia Gutierrez. Yes. And she changed your whole career direction. Tell us about that. Well, you know, you know Lydia, when I met her, you know, so there were a couple sponsors for, for that uh, uh, program. One was her firm, Casa Hacienda Foods, which still exists today in southwest Detroit. Uh, the other ballpark, uh, Brands, uh, the hot dog company. So they were both big sponsors of this program, and, uh, and she had already heard me talking about business and talking about, hey, I want to now take technology to another level and, and, again, apply it so well within business. And so I kept talking to her about business. She said, well, you know technology, I've got a lot of needs in my organization. And uh, so I did some, you know, went in, did some due diligence and evaluated her, her, her company and said, hey, there's a lot of things I could be doing for you, you know, setting up a much stronger network for you your applications, you know, your accounting systems. There's so many things I can benefit you. So I, I got my first project. And uh, uh, so I was doing this still part-time. I, I was doing this on the, the evenings and weekends. And after finishing, Larry, you know, the, the first, uh, uh, this project after about, you know, a month, uh, I went to get my first paycheck. And she said, I'm not going to pay you. And you can imagine, Larry, getting that kind of, I'm not going to pay you. Well, you know, did, did I do something wrong? And she said, no, no, no. She said, in fact, uh, you're doing so well I'm not going to pay a check directly to you. I want to pay it to your company. You're ready to start your own business. And then you did, you took you took the leap to start your own business. Right. A, a, a very successful entrepreneur entrepreneur sat in that chair in an earlier show, mm -hmm. and he said that entrepreneurs are people who are willing to do things that they're really afraid to do. Mm -hmm. Were you afraid to start your new business? Well, you know, I I guess at that point I kept thinking, well, hey, that I, I'm you know at that point I'm mid in my mid twenties. Uh, I want to gain more experience. I kept thinking more about the experience side of it. So it wasn't as much a fear, it was more around just I want to have come in into organizations with a lot more experience. And what Lydia really showed me was, one, she started pretty young uh, developing her business and that it's really not about age, it's about the value you can bring to an organization. And she felt, hey, even in your mid-twenties, you bring a lot of value, you bring a lot of passion, and if you deliver in that same way, other companies will will want to work with you and do business with you. Well, one of the other companies you worked with next was Ballpark Franks, you mentioned, a national company. And you used some pretty innovative ways to prove your worth to them before you got a contract. You got how, it. How'd that well, work? Well, you know, to this day, uh, and th this person is very uh, active here in the, in the Detroit uh, business community, uh, Dr. Clarence Nixon. He was the chief information officer at the time of Ballpark. Uh, in fact, just on the street here in, on Woodward, he has something called the T-Lab. A technology lab and he's expanding it actually in Redford, Michigan also uh, uh, the T-Lab at, at a church uh, called Detroit World Outreach. So uh, so I'm very passionate about Dr. Nixon because he, he was another person like Lydia that truly changed my life. He opened up uh, tremendous doors for me. So it, you know we laugh about it now because it was a good couple months of working and not getting paid. I, he asked me come into my organization show me the value that you know you uh, can provide, learn my organization, and there was no commitment. It was just, you know, put the time in. So it was, you know, going, doing a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, gathering all this information for him. And he finally came back to me, Larry, and he said, give me, here's, give me 10 points. If you were the CIO, what would you do? Well, what a position to be in. And I came up with my 10 points, my strategies, here's why I would do these things. And he looked at that list and he said, number four. I like number four. And of course, I knew what number four was writing a software application for all of their salespeople across the U.S. And, uh, and so that was my first project, and it was a significant one. It was so significant, Larry, that I was able to start full-time Vision IT and, and go at it full blast. Is that the difference between <coughs> an entrepreneurial leader that they're willing to put in the work and take the risk and hope it works out, as opposed to the people whose career is more climb the corporate ladder? Yeah, you know, when I, again, think back to, uh, you know, Dr. Nixon opened that door, uh, you know, I didn't look at it as risk at all, by the way, you know, in, 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 in that opportunity, because there were so many job opportunities in the IT space that I said, this is not risk at all. If I show value, if I develop, uh, you know, he's, more work is going to come. And, and the work <coughs> did come, yes. but the work changed over time. You started yes. out as a computer consultant primarily, 
and then moved into staffing. Right. <coughs> First, sure. second tier, and, sure. then, and then direct. People all often talk that leaders need to have this laser focus on the vision and not change no matter what. Where's the right balance between sticking with that original vision and then changing when new opportunities and the times change? Well, I think, Larry, r real leaders recognize when uh, things have changed and it, for the organization to thrive and grow, it's extremely important that, uh, that you change with those times. Uh, it, it was a point where, you know, in our early days, we were very well known for doing web development. Uh, we were building a lot of high-end sites. We actually built ballparkfranks.com. We did work for the city of Detroit. We did a lot of different innovative types of work. But the market began to change. It became a lot easier for people to create a, a website. There was now uh, uh, wizards just to hit next, hit next. Next thing you know, you're on the web. Very different than what we were producing. So, you know, we clearly saw that our customer base was also changing. And I'm thankful to say, you know, those same companies I used to work for, Ford Motor Company, I was now finding we had an opportunity to become a supplier. And in doing business with then Fortune 500 companies, you know, their requirements were very different and their focus was more around people. How do you provide people and, and provide people in a very timely manner with the right skill sets? And of course, we focused in on IT. Uh, so I think, you know, it's a great example area of recognizing that, you know, I can't live in the past, I have to move forward and for my organization to move forward, uh, this is the future of how Vision IT uh, was to evolve. And you made the change <coughs> and, and focused on, on, on career, or on, on staffing, and the growth went exponential. Yes. I keep seeing numbers, hundreds of percent a year, a couple of thousand percent growth over five years. You got it. How do you change your leadership perspective, or how does it change mm. for you mm. going from a one-man operation to the Vision IT that's today? Well, I, I think you got to, you know, one, recognize, you know, what, what you're really, you know, great at. And, and, and the areas where you want to strengthen, that's where you bring in uh, other you know, terrific people to be a part of the, the organization. In my case, I'm thankful I had an amazing family member, my own sister, who came from EDS, uh, they had the human resources background, they had the staffing background, that really knew the business uh, extremely well. Uh, today, she's our president of, of Vision IT. So uh, you know, th th we, that was kind of the initial core team, and then we kept bringing in other key leaders. Uh, chief financial officer to manage the, the, finance, the financial growth. Uh, then the business continued to evolve. When you start performing so well uh, on the staffing side, organizations start coming back to us saying, we want you to manage our suppliers. Well, going back to my days at Ford Motor Company, vendor management, managing other suppliers, that's what I did when I was at Ford Motor Company. So, so let's fast forward today. <clears throat> Vision IT is a business to business yes. type concern, so consumers sure. probably don't know. What is Vision IT today? What does it do, how does it do it, where does it do it? Well, well it, there's now three business units. So we evolved from, you know, we have the very strong staffing operations. Uh, it operates in the U.S., Mexico, and India. Uh, vendor management, where we're managing uh, suppliers for major corporations, companies like Pfizer. And then also we have IT managed services. We run IT operations for very significant organizations. A uh, great example is here in Detroit, Detroit Public School System. Now, You've got businesses now around the country and around the world, and you, but you fairly consistently locate your offices in the urban centers. Yes. Why that? Well, you know, it goes back to the, where the, the foundation, right? In, in being passionate about uh, impacting uh, uh, communities and the, in impacting a community like what we've done here in Detroit, our internship programs, uh, getting young people into technology. I saw that same need. So as, as Vision IT kept evolving, I kept seeing that need. I'd go into Chicago, open an office in Chicago. I saw the same need. New York City saw the same need. So I felt it was very important that as Vision IT grows, uh, we get very active in the community. We learn that, that, that market. We hire good local people to develop out the organization and, and, that, and serve customers you know, on the ground. But the community involvement is still a very core part of Vision IT. Thanks for being here, David. Okay. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll talk with David Segura about being recruited by the White House.
Welcome back to Leaders on Leadership. Joining us today is David Segura, founder and CEO of Vision IT. We're talking about his service on President Obama's White House Forum on Modernizing Government. You got, you, last year you got mm. recruited by the President of the United States to be on, okay. on, on the forum to help modernize the United States government. What's his charge to your group? Well, well so this was a, a, a really somewhat of a, a summit to bring together uh, a, uh, top CEOs was 50 CEOs across America of organizations that are uh, have gone through high growth, uh, have utilized technology and implemented effectively in the private sector, uh, and and have have you know utilized it well for business processes and automation. So these are the things that the president and his administration recognize that how do we apply this to the federal government? How do we how do we streamline processes? How do we be much smarter about the business of of of, uh, of the U.S. government. So you know what an opportunity. And and you know what was unique was it was pretty much mostly Fortune 500 CEOs. Uh, and so to be in in such a, a, a great network of of leaders across uh, America, it was pretty unique. I think I was one of maybe two other uh, leaders that are from the state of Michigan. So I felt also I was definitely representing Michigan. And it gave us some time to interact with the chief information officers of the major U.S. departments. And the beauty of it was it created the initial dialogue, but that dialogue has continued uh, you know, across uh, 2010, and now it's, it's, it's uh, really developing for 2011. Besides providing service to the administration and, mm. and to the nation, mm. do you also get something out of it by spending this time with 50 CEOs from these yeah, other I, successful CEOs? You know, do you I, learn from each other? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I feel like uh, you know, when you're always focused on serving, uh, you know, so much comes back to you. And so, you know, I, I remember, you know, w there was uh, the Obama transition, I got a call to even be a part of some of those initial meetings. And, you know, you go there, Larry, without the intent, hey, I, you know, I'm going there to serve. I want to help our country. I want to help it improve. And, you know, going back to the days of being here, just, you know, focus on Detroit. Now I'm, I've got a, you know, an, uh, you know, what a platform to be on. And so, you know, that's where it starts. And you know what happens? So many things come back. And, you know, already some of the relationships that I developed, uh, you know, through that forum, just continue to, to open up, you know, so many new doors for, for Vision IT. And, you know, and I found that, you know, today we're becoming an ambassador for the city of Detroit. There's a lot of CEOs, a lot of senior leaders. There's leaders even from, uh, you know, the administration that have come to Detroit uh, for, for, to, for meetings with us. And while they come, of course, they're spending a lot more time in our city. And, uh, and it, that means a lot. And, you know, it feels good to, to be a part of that. Your grandparents came to this country, mm -hmm. first members of your family. What do you think they would have thought about the idea when they first arrived here that their grandson is going to be going to the White House to advise mm. the president? You know, I, I thought that recently the, the, uh, the other day because I took my family, we had uh, the, the opportunity, we were invited during Christmas time where they opened up uh, the East Wing of the White House. And, uh, I, you know, walking through the White House uh, and into those doors and just being, looking around, I just kept thinking, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I know they came here with viewing this is a land of opportunity. And so much, you know, people talk about, you know, our country and the state it's in. Uh, I think, you know, our story and the Vision IT story is a great example to say, you know, only in America can something like this happen where you can start from, as you shared, Larry, $100 and putting in $100 in a bank saying, I just want to impact, I want to help, I want to help those around me, and it can open up so many doors and, 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 it, and you get all these great opportunities to serve. It comes with hard work, with diligence, with you know working strategically and you know delivering for for your customers but it can and earning come. that reputation but it can happen yeah. and i think that's a message to you know all the wayne state students that are here with us today now the president appointed you to another uh group later last year mm -hmm. on uh, <coughs> on trade policy yes and negotiation right now it has been kind of the poster child mm -hmm. for offshoring yes, for a yes, long yes. time and you've got offices offshore mm -hmm. but you also have a program on urban onshore right the name of the urban, urban onshore. Urban yeah, onshore. That, that's it. Explain that to us. Urban How does that work? Urban onshore is here in Detroit. So you know, one of the reasons why uh, you know the administration, of course, is it definitely sees a growth in U.S. job creation through uh, exporting uh, products as well as services. And so when I was able to tell the administration the story of Vision IT, how we've grown uh, so quickly in Mexico, it, it's a great market for Vision IT. We sell our services uh, in in the Mexican market. And uh, one example, and so when they saw how well we've grown, they said, you know, you're a blueprint for other uh, businesses that are here in the U.S. And that's one of the reasons why we want you to serve. 
uh, on trade. Now, when it comes to urban onshore, let's leverage Detroit. Let's leverage, you know, we can leverage offshore. We can uh, utilize like we have in, in Mexico, Puebla, as one of our delivery centers. We focused in initially on our delivery center right here in the city of Detroit in our, in our facilities in New Center One. So it's delivering IT services. It's creating jobs in the city of Detroit. And we think, uh, we, as we've proven, this is a great place to do business. <laughs> In, in the, time, the couple of times that I've met you before and, and here today, mm -hmm. you're clearly a high energy kind of guy. <laughs> How important is it that the leader of an organization be seen as high energy, both to employees and to customers, mm -hmm. clients? Well, you know, I often think about this, Larry, because I've met some entrepreneurs that are you know, very different than myself uh, and they have different styles. And I think you have to be just who you really are. And, and, and when I started Vision IT, you know, the culture we built, it was built around what I felt were, you know, key values. And you look at the historic great companies of our time, companies like, you know, one, one I'm actually heading this week to Atlanta, and one of our customers is UPS. And I got a chance to, you know, when, when I go at times, I'll have meetings at UPS headquarters. And you go in the lobby, and you see the history of this company, and, and the values that the company still talks about goes back to this young man at UPS who started the business, and the values that he felt were important to his organization. So. Uh, you know, so Vision IT, it is a high energy place. It's a place with a lot of passion. That's the kind of people that, you know, we attract into our organization. Um, so. Now, sorry, now, now Vision IT is usually described as entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. midsize, and a minority business enterprise. Mm. You see that a lot. Sure, sure. Does, does the, the sobriquet that they put on the organization, minority company, does mm -hmm. that change the way that you lead, or is that just an artificial category that outsiders impose upon you? Sure, you know, great question, Larry. Uh, you know, we, so much has changed uh, for Vision IT. In fact, a lot of our customers today uh, even really don't even look or even, they, they even forget that we are, hey, this is a, a minority-owned business or diversity-owned business. So clearly, you know, for us, you know, diversity has opened new doors at, 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 at times. Uh, it's an opportunity to be introduced to an organization, but you still have to do all the business basics. You gotta, you gotta deliver, you gotta show value, uh, and, it, and that's uh, more important than ever. Uh, there's a lot of people with certifications, and that's just a certification that exists. But, you know, our focus and how we've grown, uh, and, and one a other aspect around diversity that I felt was very important for Vision IT was not just the ownership, but really impacting diversity within the IT industry. And so we got very active and involved in creating more diversity in the Hispanic, African American community especially. We put a, a lot of support, and I actually helped found an organization started in Detroit called HITECH, which brings together Hispanic chief information officers from not only all across the U.S., but all across the Americas. And that organization has just blossomed and grown. Last evening, President Obama <coughs> gave the 2011 State of the Union Address. Yes. And one of his statements was that we, in America, we need to outwork, out-educate, out-innovate mm. the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. What's the one key thing that business leaders can do in any sector to make that happen? Well, I, I think, you know, one, we, ha we have to be uh, uh, clearly active in, in, the, in our educational system. Uh, you know, as I share with you, one of our customers is the Detroit public school system. Uh, that's to me not a contract. Uh, that's something I'm passionate about because we have to, uh, we have to develop and grow uh, our young people so that they can compete at the level. So education is, is so extremely important. It's the reason why you asked about being in all those urban centers because we get active in those local communities and we get active at the educational level. Uh, that's, that, that to me is, is, is again such a, a focus for our leaders of Fortune 500 companies, mid-sized companies, small businesses. If we, we're all active, if we're all supporting, and, and again, being, being focused in specific areas, we can make an impact. Okay. I've got one last question sure. for you, David. You started your career in the corporate life and now you're an entrepreneur. Let's assume you wake up tomorrow morning mm. and you're now CEO of a Fortune 50 company, not in IT. Mm. How are you gonna transfer your leadership insights and experiences from being an entrepreneur in your own company mm. to a corporate giant? Well, one thing that, you know, I, I went back and said, what made Vision IT, what makes Vision IT special and what was at the root of it? Focused, agile, streamlined, talented. And those attributes can apply to a mid-sized organization like Vision IT, a Fortune 50 company like, uh, like you're mentioning now. Being focused, knowing what you're good at, being agile in the relationships, being agile in your ability to respond to needs, uh, streamlined, being a very process-driven organization, and talent. It's about getting the very best people in your organization 
aligned and focused and engaged. Thanks for being here, David. Okay, outstanding, thank you. Please join us again next time for another edition of Leaders on Leadership. See you then.